Um, thank you very much for uh, the introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to be presenting here today. Um, and yes, I will be talking in greater detail about uh, a number of the results that uh, Daniel just mentioned. Um, so to get things started, I want to start with a very just brief high level overview of what I'm going to be talking about today and for the rest of the week. Um, and then we'll dive into the material for today. Um, so the talk today and the talks this week more broadly, they're all motivated by a number of adva advances in, uh, sorry, the, the slides issue, a number of advances that have happened in the theory of interior point methods over the last decade. So over the last decade, there have been many, many advances on either improving the theory behind interior point methods or finding new applications of interior point methods and interior point method best techniques to get faster algorithms for solving a wide range of problems. And the key goals of the talk, the, the talks I'm giving this week are to give a, brief, a survey of a number of these advances and try to convey some of the intuition behind what makes these methods work and what are some of the key concepts and ideas underlying these advances are. Um, another goal is to go cover some of the fundamentals of interior point methods and I cover a few of the more basic uh, um, techniques that underlie many of these methods and try to give some geometric pictures and intuition for interior point methods that I think would help be, uh, provide useful grounding for understanding a number of these advances in different contexts. And finally, as we have time throughout the talk, I'll be trying to give a taste of some of the newer components of these interior point methods um, that have been used to get faster algorithms. Um, no previous experience with interior point methods are needed for any of these lectures. I'll be covering um, things as they're needed. And please, at any time, if you have questions or I have accidentally gone and assumed some knowledge about something, please uh, don't hesitate to ask, ask a question or uh, ping Daniel to ask me a question. Um, all right, so with that in mind, the talk plan for this week is as follows. Um, first, the lecture today, I'm gonna start with a brief survey of all of the, a number of these advances that have happened over the last decade. My focus is gonna be on advances in interior point methods as they've been used to solve linear programming. And I'm gonna talk about a number of combinatorial applications of these advances or advances in combinatorial optimization using interior point methods. In particular, I'll talk about the state of the art for problems like minimum cost transshipment, bipartite matching, maximum flow, and more. Um, that's what we'll be doing today. What we'll be covering tomorrow is we'll be going into greater detail on interior point methods themselves. The goal for the lecture tomorrow is to give a bit more of a geometric picture behind interior point methods, cover some of the fundamental techniques um, and analysis techniques that underlie interior point methods. I'm going to use throughout the lecture tomorrow Real linear programming and minimum cost transshipment, a fundamental combinatorial pro optimization problem is running examples. And as a uh, lecture wraps up uh, tomorrow, and what I'll be doing on the final lecture on Thursday is then covering a number of advances that have happened over the, the last decade. In particular, I'll be covering um, some of the results that Daniel mentioned on getting faster convergence rates from interior point methods. I'll talk about robust primal dual methods a little bit, and I might touch upon a number of techniques that I think have been interesting, like two-sided barriers and vector maintenance and things like that. So what this all means is today, um, there's actually gonna be very fairly little uh, math in the lecture today. I guess uh, this is, as I did said, the last lecture of today. So maybe that's not, not bad for uh, and wrap, wrapping up today's uh, series of lectures. Um, so there won't be too much technical material. Instead, what I'll be doing today is giving this survey and this kind of high level overview or a framework for thinking of a number of advances that have happened over the last decade. And that way when we start our technical coverage tomorrow and it gets even more advanced on Thursday, we kind of have this larger landscape of uh, work to think about um, as we build these different technical tools. Um, please ask me questions throughout. Um, again, my hope in all of this is that by the end of the week, you have a number of concrete technical tools, as well as a bunch of intuition for how it fits together and how this landscape of many, many papers that I mentioned on the first slide all fit together. Um, so that's the plan um, for this week. Any questions before I kind of get started with the material for today? People can see the slides at least. Let me let me check that. Could use some some thumbs up. I'll probably ask yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. I think I can at least see them. So hopefully, uh, and I'm also remote. So hopefully, uh, 
the rest of uh, the audience can also see. Great. Even if you don't want to turn on your camera, if you don't mind doing thumbs up for some of the questions, I'll, I'll probably ask a few times. Um, so great. Thanks. All right, so the plan for today is as follows. First, I'm gonna give a brief introduction and motivation for studying interior point methods. Um, uh, that I'm then gonna do is cover in greater detail some of the advances that have happened in linear programming over the past decade. So to try to get a feel for the state of the art and get some grounding for thinking about the last part of the talk today, where I'll talk about a number of advances from interior point methods related to some of these linear programming advances However, I'll be talking about advances for a number of different combinatorial optimization problems, things like max flow, bipartite matching, and minimum cost transshipment. And that's the plan for today. All right. Any questions before, before we really dive into the material? OK. All right, so in my opinion, a lot of uh, what I'll be talking about or advances in interior point methods is rooted in a broader line of work that's happened over the last decade and using continuous optimization um, to solve, get provably faster rates and faster run times for solving a range of continuous and combinatorial optimization problems. So my various biased, very biased opinion um, over the last decade, a key takeaway, at least, at least for me, is that continuous optimization can be a very useful and powerful tool for solving a wide, wide range of optimization problems provably faster. So there's a, a long list of combinatorial optimization problems, things like maximum flow, bipartite matching, semodular optimization, minimum cost flow, and more, where over the last decades, faster run times have been achieved for solving these problems and uh, solving these problems by in some way, shape, or form using continuous optimization methods. Beyond getting faster run times, this has helped with you know, improved parallel and distributed algorithms in various settings. And um, in my own view of this, which is, again, a bit biased, is that I think from all of these advances that have happened over the last decade, I think of continuous optimization techniques, things like gradient descent and interior point methods that we'll talk about today, is just on the list of sort of fundamental algorithmic paradigms we have for solving the problems. Just like we think of greedy and divide and conquer um, and dynamic programming is sort of of the principal tools and techniques we use to get faster run times for solving problems. I think of iterative methods like gradient descent and interior point methods as having the same role. Now, interior point methods are one broad class of continuous optimization techniques. And pretty much everything I said about continuous optimization over the last decade applies equally well to interior point methods. Um, maybe with the exception, there are some problems like some modular optimization where, you know, we currently haven't gotten faster run times for solving that problem using interior point methods. Um, but I actually think that's a great open problem in some sense. Maybe the first I'll, I'll mention of the day. Um, with regards to interior point methods in general, as part of this broader theme, there, there are two broader takeaways um, that I want to state right away and have you think about as I go through the talks this week. Um, the first takeaway is that I think interior point methods are a particularly powerful reduction framework. So we'll talk about how interior point methods as a technique, I think are a very useful paradigm to reduce solving a particularly hard combinatorial optimization problem to solving some other problem that maybe has improved complexity. So I think they're a powerful, like we'll, we'll talk about it more as we see different examples, but sort of reduction framework to reduce solving these problems to high accuracy to some different algorithmic challenge that maybe we can apply different tools to. And the other key take, takeaway um, to hopefully get from the lecture today and this week is that for a number of these problems, by both improving interior point methods and thinking about what sort of algorithmic techniques we might need to implement these interior point methods more efficiently, we can get faster algorithms for solving a number of problems. And that there's a lot of value in sort of this joint design of the interior point method um, and the way we're going to implement those interior point methods towards getting faster algorithms. So what we'll be talking about this week um, in covering interior point methods. So uh, as I mentioned today, I'll be surveying a bit of the state of the art. Um, this week, I'll be covering a number of the key ideas that underlie these different interior point advances. I'll talk about a number of connections. You know, we'll go back and forth in the week between 
talking about interior point methods for linear programming and talking about interior point methods or combinatorial problems like max flow. We'll go into greater detail on um, different ways of improving the rates of uh, ways of improving the rates of interior point methods in certain regimes. And I'll talk about some ideas underlying some of the recent sort of fastest algorithms that have uh, come. I should uh, come, come in this line of work. Um, I should note this is a bit of a biased uh, survey that we'll be taking this week, um, but I'm happy to take questions on um, anything in this space. Um, but I should mention there's a few things we won't cover in greater detail um, this week, just in case uh, you're looking for it. So this week we'll be particularly focused on sort of the advances in interior point methods. And at various times in the week, I'll talk about advances that have happened in the data structures or linear system solvers or different components that have gone into um, implementing interior point methods and thereby getting faster run times. But my focus is primarily going to be on interior point methods themselves and what they serve as a reduction framework to hopefully give you some tools to use them in different contexts. Um, there's also, if you may have heard, there's some particular advances that have happened over the last decade that I may touch upon, but won't be covering in quite as greater detail in this broader space of advances. Um, if you're curious about some of these other advances that I'll touch upon, um, please feel free to ask uh, questions during the talks or I guess on the Slack. Um, and also you can check out some of the workshops that will be happening later in the program where I would guess, but I don't know for sure that some of the speakers may be covering some of these techniques to, to greater detail. Um, so, so again, I want to do this just so you get a sense of to know what to expect and not to expect from the lectures this week. Um, and as I've said a few times now, I guess the main goal is to give you this frame of reference for diving deeper into all of these results um, and, and maybe improving them and attaining some exciting results of your own. All right, so that's it for motivation. I'm going to start diving into linear programming. Um, anyone have a question so far? All right, the plan clear to everyone so far? Great. A few more thumbs up or questions if, ah, great, okay. I wasn't looking at all the screens of thumbs up. It doesn't collect that. All right, great. All right, so for the next little bit, to, to start discussing and thinking through some of these advances that have happened in interior point methods over the last decade, I'm gonna start by talking about one very canonical prominent setting for studying and designing interior point methods, and that's linear programming. And for um, a good chunk of the talk today, and a lot of the talks later in this week, we'll be considering the problem of solving linear programs given in the following primal and dual form. Um, I should note there's a number of different canonical ways of writing linear programs in primal and dual form. There's a number of different notational choices. Um, these are the ones I'll try to stick with uh, this week, but I should warn I went back and forth on what notation to use a few times because depending what work you want to present, there's a different set of notation that's perhaps preferable to that. And if I deviate from this notation or if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me. All right, so why are we going to consider these problems? Um, first, linear programming is just a very fundamental, canonical, prevalent, continuous, and or combinatorial optimization problem, depending on your perspective. And it's a problem that cleanly encompasses a number of fundamental combinatorial problems, like maximum flow and bipartite matching, and the, the same range of applications I've been mentioning throughout the talk. That's why you might want to study in linear programming in general. The reason we're going to focus on it a lot uh, this week is that I think it's a rather canonical setting for introducing um, and motivating and analyzing interior point methods. As we'll see tomorrow, interior point methods are a broad range of techniques that apply fairly broadly to convex programming beyond linear programming, but I think it's helpful to have one slightly more concrete um, optimization problem to think about in looking at interior point methods. Um, and I think also linear programs are nice to study as they come with a nice geometric picture that I'll appeal to throughout the lectures, and they naturally encompass a number of combinatorial optimization problems. All right, so let's just make sure we're all clear on the problem. So I'll do a quick refresh on, on uh, let's just do a quick discussion of what these problems look like and what their geometry is before we increasingly talk about the different advances over the last decade in solving them. So again, our goal through much of the lectures this week is to solve a linear program. When I draw pictures for solving linear programs, I'll typically draw pictures for the dual optimization problem. 
where we say we have some constraint matrix A, some constraint vector B. We want to restrict to the feasible region of all Y where AY is at least B entry-wise. And we want to uh, optimize over that set of Y where AY is at least B. And over that set, we want to minimize the inner product of C with Y where C is some vector we call a cost vector. So we'll call this inner product of C with Y the cost. We'll want to minimize cost subject to AY being at least B. Now, if we think of this feasible region, you know, when I draw this matrix A, I'll typically let A1 through AN denote the rows of the matrix. So for linear programming, I'll assume we're in D dimensions and that the linear program is N constraints. So every row of the matrix A is one of these vectors AI. I'll use B1 through BN to note the entries of B. And the constraint that AY is at least B entry-wise, if we look at a single row of this matrix or entry of B, we see that this constraint is that the inner product of Y with some row of the matrix is at least some entry of the vector B. If we looked at the region where this was not an inequality, but rather equality, you know, we'd get, um, we get uh, this, we get this line in uh, RD. Um, if we, since we're working with the inequality, the set of Y where the inner product of A, um, the row of A and Y is at least B is some half space in um, RD. And our feasible region is the intersection of these n half spaces. Now, if we take this intersection in two dimensions, we get a convex polygon. In higher dimensions, it's a convex region known as a polytope. Um, now, our goal is to optimize over the interior of this polytope, um, or op optimize over the points in this polytope, the points where AY is at least B. We want to minimize the cost. And when I draw these pictures, I'll typically have the cost vector pointed straight up. So our goal is typically going to be to find the bottom of this high dimensional convex polytope, right? So that's the problem that we're trying to solve when solving linear programming. Now, there's a number of standard met. Now, our goal in solving these linear programs throughout this talk, I'm going to be primarily focused on solving linear programs to high precision in polynomial time. So we're going to be looking for solutions, uh, algorithms that can solve linear programs with a polylogarithmic dependence on the accuracy we're aiming for and a polynomial dependence on dimension. So things like N and D. In that regime, there's a number of standard methods for solving uh, linear programs. So there's the classic simplex method where we start with a vertex of the polytope and iteratively move along the boundary of the polytope to another vertex, trying to decrease the value. This can be very fast in practice, but analyzing in theory has been somewhat uh, complicated over the years. Um, there's the ellipsoid method where you start with some convex set that contains the entire polytope, or at least make sure to contain the minimizer. And iteratively, we shrink this convex set, maintaining the invariant that it contains the minimizer of the linear program until it contains very little other than the minimizer and we get the solution to the linear program. Um, these methods um, come with some nice provable, there are some nice provable rates for these methods. So, um, they have a somewhat moderate uh, performance, both in theory and in practice. And there are interior point methods, um, which as the name suggests, they start with a point in the interior of the polytope. They iteratively trying to decrease um, the cost of the vector while maintaining that the point is in the interior of the polytope. And these methods in theory, as we'll see, are often the fastest algorithms we have for solving linear programs, and they can often be fast in practice as well. And I'll be primarily focused on interior point methods throughout the lecture today and this week, as the titles of the talk suggest. All right, um, before going any further, I wanna note that there are other regimes for studying linear programming that I think are very natural and fundamental to consider, but we won't be talking about quite as much today. So again, our focus is primarily this week is going to be on solving linear programs with a polynomial dependence on dimension and a polylogarithmic dependence on things like condition number or accuracy. So we'll be typically aiming for methods that you know, have this polylogarithmic dependence on things like the error that we'll achieve or approximate feasibility for solving the um, linear program or some measure of conditioning of the linear program at a cost of a polynomial dependence on dimension. Um, I might sometimes refer to these as inf little informally as weakly polynomial methods, um, but I should note that there's other natural regimes you could take to study the problem and different methods that apply in those contexts. So for instance, you could also ask for methods that are maybe I'd say pseudo polynomial and that they have a polynomial dependence on the accuracy or the condition number of the problem. 
And over the last decade, there's actually been a number of advances on getting better rates for solve and faster algorithms for solving linear programs in this regime. There are a number of gradient based methods that have gotten improved uh, run times in different settings in, in this regime. Um, in this regime. Um, um, earlier in the summer, I actually gave a talk on some of these advances under the heading of box simplex games. Um, I gave this talk at ADFOCS and I'm hoping to post it soon on my website. There might be some notes on this. It was one of many different coverages of some of the advances in iterative methods for solving linear programs. However, we won't be talking about them very much this week. Um, the other natural setting you might take for solving linear programs is to aim for strongly polynomial methods. Those are methods that have no dependence on um, the accuracy or the condition number. There's been interesting work on getting um, improved strongly polynomial methods for solving both linear programs and a number of the combinatorial problems we'll discuss this week in different settings. However, I won't really talk about them this week unless they give a faster um, runtime in the weekly polynomial setting. Um, but there's been a number of interesting uh, work in this, some of which by the organizers of the program this uh, semester. And you can ask them or on the Slack if you want more information on those or ask if it's relevant to some of the talks. But we'll be primarily being focused on this high precision weekly polynomial time regime this week. All right, any questions so far? All right. So I already said this very broadly. I want to be a little bit more specific on um, why I think it's particularly exciting to be studying interior point methods. So from this context, interior point methods, though we'll be primarily talking about them for linear programs and problems like maximum flow, in general, they're a very robust optimization framework that applies much more broadly to convex optimization. Um, and there are even settings I think people have designed variants of interior point methods to try to get runtime and to try to um, solve certain non-convex optimization problems as well. Um, in general, I think it's exciting to be studying interior point methods because they're this very general optimization framework that in general can be used to solve convex optimization problems to high precision. They generically have this feature of a polylogarithmic dependence on the desired accuracy and condition number, um, and therefore um, can yield nice rates for in a number of different settings. Um, they also have a nice feature that in practice, they tend, they, they sometimes perform even better than the worst case theory. So. Um, they, they, they can be a practical algorithm in different settings as well. Um, that's why I think um, it's exciting to study interior point methods in general. Um, in the context of this talk this week, or as a theorist, I think it's particularly exciting times to be studying interior point methods, because I think from these two features of, you know, being methods that are sort of robust against ill conditioning and solve problems to high precision, um, at the cost of potentially dimension dependence, they're a very general purpose tool for finding and exploiting structure when you want to solve optimization problems to high precision. And correspondingly, for a growing list of problems, the fastest runtimes we have um, now in some way, shape, or form use interior point methods. Um, I think particularly um, exciting over the last decade is while it's like long been known that interior point methods have these features that, that they give weekly polynomial runtimes and at the cost of some dimension dependence, they give a way of solving these optimization problems to high precision. Um, it's also been known, and we'll talk about that, you know, although it happens in practice, proving in theory that the interior point methods don't take too many iterations has been very difficult. The number of iterations of interior point method in the worst case from the best theory we have often takes some polynomial dimension iterations. And from that, you might think that we could use interior point methods to get faster runtimes but maybe actually using it to get a near optimal runtime in any setting would be elusive just because you, you take too many iterations. Um, however, as we'll, we'll talk about over the last decade, interior point methods have actually been used to get nearly linear, nearly optimal runtimes in certain settings. And I think all of this points to, I think it's rather exciting times to be studying interior point methods to be getting faster algorithms. And I think there are many open problems and it's a very active research area and I'll touch upon this throughout the talk. All right. So, all right, let's start talking about, so, so to um, start talking a bit more formally about interior point methods and their, their performance on linear programming or different combinatorial optimization problems. I wanna start talking about the, the improvements over the last decade for interior point methods for solving linear programs. 
Um, now, as I've already alluded to, interior point methods don't refer to one single method. They're rather a general term used to, uh, used to describe a pretty broad range of optimization methods. And like many optimization methods, I think um, for thinking about interior point methods, it's helpful to think of them as a sort of reduction framework that lets us turn solving one difficult optimization problem, say a linear program or maximum flow, to solving a sequence of simpler optimization problems. So if you wanna think about the performance of an interior point method, first pass, I think, to think about the complexity of an interior point method or how effective it is for solving linear programming or a combinatorial optimization problem. I, I think it's helpful first pass to break this down into how many sub problems does the interior point method solve? So how many iterations are there in the interior point method? And then how hard or what is the actual computational complexity of solving those subproblems? All right. So up to the last five years from this framework, I can now say what, what the, um, the state of the art has been on using interior point methods to solve linear programs. So again, we want to solve linear programs in this primal dual form. We're working in D dimensions and we're trying to solve linear programs with N constraints. And um, the improvements over the last, uh, many of the improvements in, uh, up to just the last uh, decade look as follows. So the first proof of an interior point method that can be used to solve a linear program in polynomial time was due to Karmakar in 1984 and gave an interior point method that could solve a linear program in n iterations, where the cost of every iteration was on the order of solving a certain linear system involving A. Um, and I should note this wasn't some arbitrary linear system. Essentially, the cost of every iteration of Karmakar's method, I might refer to as informally as the cost of essentially projecting a vector onto the image of some rescaling of A. Um, more formally, the cost of every iteration of Karmakar's method um, was the, the computational bottleneck was the cost of given some diagonal matrix D um, solving a linear system in A transpose DA. This is not exactly the same, but pretty close. You can think this is like solving a, a regression problem in some row rescaling of A. Um, this was improved by 1986 by Renegar, who improved this n iteration count to root n. And until maybe the last uh, decade, the fastest algorithms we had in, in theory um, and sometimes in practice were essentially var variants of this result of Renegar's in 1986. Right. However, if we're solving a linear program in D dimensions, in general, the number of constraints n could be much, much larger than D. Um, so as n grows, the iter number of iterations of these methods gets higher and higher. However, fortunately, there were these very interesting results of uh, Vaidya in the late 80s um, that showed you can get slightly better iteration counts. So you can get a d iteration method or uh, nd to the fourth iteration method, where at the, and you could do this at the cost of a slightly more expensive iteration cost. So these methods, um, the, the most computationally expensive step in each of these methods Rather than simply solving a linear system in A, the cost of each iterations of these methods was essentially to compute the entire projection matrix associated with a row rescaling of A. So these methods, the computational expensive step, either involved comp computing um, this entire projection matrix or it's computing diagonal, which you naively would require D or N linear systems respectively. Um, however, as N gets larger and larger, you might hope for lower and lower iteration complexities. And fortunately, there was this very beautiful, cool result of Nesterov and Nemirovsky in 1994 that showed in general, you can improve this root n to a root d. Um, unfortunately, the cost of every iteration of this method um, involves solving a subproblem that was, is more expensive in the worst case and the best run times we have for linear programming itself. Now, the first time you hear this result, it might sound a little silly, if I give you access to an oracle that can do more computational work than linear programming, then I can easily use it to solve linear programming in one iteration by just like solving the linear program. However, I think what's really interesting about this result is there's a strong sense in which that's not what this result said. Instead, what they showed was that there was a function that depended only on the polytope. Um, so there was a barrier or something that depended only on the set AY larger than B and not the cost C. And they showed that if you had sufficient access to this function, then you could in principle design a method that had this root D iteration complexity. 
So in some sense, it was a way of saying, if you understood the geometry of a polytope well enough, then you could get uh, faster iterations. Right? Um, so for many years, it looked like um, you could get faster and faster interior point methods or turn this root n dependence into a root d dependence at the cost of more and more expensive iterates. Um, however, there is a joint work of Yintet Lee and myself that showed that you actually don't need to make this trade-off up to logarithmic factors. And there's, in fact, a method that has um, roughly root d iterations, where the cost of every iteration of that method is uh, roughly on the order of Karmakar and Renegard's method of solving single linear systems in A. Um, Tomorrow and on Thursday, we'll cover this result of Renegar's, uh, we'll, we'll cover this root n iteration complexity rather thoroughly, um, and we'll start covering and cover to some degree these improvements of root n to root d. All right. However, this only covers the advances up to the last five years. There's actually been a number of advances since then. There's been a variety of progress since these results on improving the runtime of linear programming. Um, however, this, I'm going to first phrase this as a puzzle. Um, actually improving upon any of these complexities as I've just stated them. So getting better than a root d iteration method that solves a polylogarithmic number of systems per iteration, this is actually still an open problem. And on that problem, there's essentially been no progress. This is still the state of the art. Um, in fact, I'd probably describe this as one of the biggest still remaining open problems in interior point methods for linear programming of whether or not it's possible to design an in some sort of interior point method that has a better than root d iteration complexity for solving linear programs. Um, there's been some lower bounds showing that particular methods you might conjecture would yield this complexity do not. So there's been work showing that certain interior point methods people have designed don't have a better iteration complexity, but it's open to show whether or not there's some interior point method that has a better iteration complexity. I think this is still one of the largest open problems in the theory of interior point methods for linear programming. There's essentially been no progress on that problem as I've stated it. However, there's been a variety of work improving the runtime for solving linear programming over the past decade, over the past five years. And essentially the way these improvements work, so this might sound a little bit like a, a contradiction, the way these improvements have worked over the past five years is rather than just improving how, trying to improve the complex, the number of iterations or improve what needs to be done for the complexity of solving a single iteration, there's been a number of advances in improving the run times for solving linear programs by treating essentially the entire sequence of iterations um, of a linear program, of, of an interior point method, treating the problem of computing those iterates as essentially a dynamic data structure problem. So in other words, rather than trying to improve the complexity of computing a single iterate of the interior point methods, this work has considered the problem of computing what you need to compute in a sequence of iterates of the interior point methods, thinking of that as some sort of dynamic data structure problem and trying to design faster algorithms for solving that dynamic data structure problem. What this work has essentially shown is that if you improve, um, get improved interior point methods, so you get interior point methods that maybe handle more approximation in with the iterates, or only need to compute some aspect of the iteration more crudely, this essentially corresponds to easier constraints on whatever this data structure problem is of implementing the interior point method. And then a big uh, takeaway that I'll, I'll try to impart over this week is that these improvements have been such that you can actually show that some of these data structure problems are actually implementable in nearly linear time on average over the course of the entire linear program. So even though these interior point methods um, that we'll discuss all take either root D or root N iterations, um, you can actually implement every iteration uh, cheap enough that the overall runtime is nearly linear in certain settings. Any questions on the state of the art for a number of iterations of an interior point method or this idea of dynamic data structures before I say what the actual state of the art runtimes are? Everyone with me so far? All right. All right. So, with all that in mind, what's the actual state of the art runtimes for linear programming? Um, so, the first uh, result that I'll tell you so, one state of the art is the following. 
Um, so uh, work of Ian Tedley and myself, building on an actual long line of history in um, a long line, uh, long line of work in implementing interior point methods showed you could achieve the following runtime. Now, what this algorithm essentially consists of is the root D iteration method I said before. So it's a root dimension iteration method where every iteration you need to solve a linear system. However, the, um, the way it achieves this runtime is by noting that in every iteration, the linear system you need to solve doesn't change too much on average in some, in some way. Um, this is actually a very classic observation about interior point methods that we'll discuss a bit more. And in the, it, even since the work of Karmakar, it's been noted that the complexity of solving um, the linear systems in interior point methods can be improved by leveraging that in some sense, approximately on average, the changes in the linear systems you solve are low rank. So this work, what was, uh, work consists of this root iteration method, as well as this data structure, uh, a slightly improved data structure for solving each of the linear systems you have to solve. Um, to get a better sense of this runtime, I first want to note this was the previous best runtime for large enough polynomially bounded n. Um, and another way to think about this iteration complexity is suppose that in every iteration, you try to solve this problem of solving a linear system in A, so solving a linear system in A transpose DA. Suppose you tried to do that naively, like you didn't treat that as a data structure problem, you just tried to apply the best linear system solving results that we know. Um, so the state of the art for solving A transpose DA is time nearly linear in the, um, in the, in the number of non-zero entries in the matrix A plus D to the omega, where omega here is the matrix multiplication time. So essentially, if you want to solve a single one of the linear systems you need for um, our method or Karmakar Renegar's method, um, the cost of that was linear plus this D the omega, which for dense matrices is the state of the art we have for just solving a D by D linear system. All right. um, yeah, there's been recent exciting work that says that when the case when the matrix is sparse, there are slightly better run times, but I'll just be focusing on this dense regime. All right. So you can think, um, so if this D, D squared was a D the omega, this would just be the cost of uh, naively uh, using a state-of-the-art linear system solver and implement every iteration. And essentially what these inverse maintenance data structures say is you can get a runtime as if omega was two using the current values of omega. Okay. The second state-of-the-art has to do with a sequence of breakthroughs that happened in a few years that showed you can solve linear, these linear programs and end the omega time for the current value of omega, which is something a little less than 2.373. Interestingly, the way these methods work, these end the omega runtimes, is they don't use this root D iteration method, but rather they just use root N iteration methods. Like it's something, think similar to, to Renegar's method. Um, the way this method worked is they essentially developed a robust version of that root n method that showed you only needed to implement the iterations very crudely. Like you only need to maintain your primal and dual iterates multiplicatively in some, in some sense. Um, they then developed data structures for maintaining these iterates approximately, where the average cost of maintaining these crude multiplicative approximations to the iterates is actually sublinear in the size of the input on average in some cases. Um, interestingly, this runtime matches the best known running time we have, even just for the simpler problem of checking whether there is an X where A transpose X equals B. In the case when N is roughly D and there's no sparsity assumptions. So without improving the runtime for solving dense square linear systems, this runtime is unimprovable. Though I should note in the case of sparse systems, there is this uh, interesting uh, recent work of Peggy and Paula that showed that you can solve slightly faster when the matrix is sparse. Um, I also should note that one of these results um, in the sequence on getting these n to the omega runtimes, it's actually one of the few advances I'll talk about uh, throughout this week that's deterministic rather than randomized. So I guess there's a, another open problem there that most of the advances I'll talk about this week are through randomized algorithms. All right. So until the last two years, this was the state of the art. Um, however, there's a natu few natural questions you'd still ask about these results. You know, you could ask, can we improve further? And what about this question I keep asking about, can we actually solve any instances near optimally? 
So this n to the omega runtime is conditionally optimal, you know, on in, improving the runtime for solving dense square linear systems. Um, however, neither of these results for sufficiently large for any regime of n and d is actually nearly linear time. Okay. Um, however, there's been a recent joint work in just the last two years that shows um, one more runtime in this mix of uh, recent advances showed that you can solve linear programs in ND plus some poly D time. So to think about this result, suppose that our input is dense, the number of non-zero in the entries of the matrix is ND. You know, in principle, the matrix could have ND non-zero entries. And suppose N is sufficiently large and is some polynomial in D, um, some, some sufficiently large polynomial in D. In that case, ND is larger than poly D just by this assumption. And when the input is dense, ND is the same as the number of non-zeros in the matrix. So it's basically the size of representing the input. So in that case where the input's dense and tall, there's sufficiently many constraints, this corresponds to a nearly linear runtime. Um, hence, uh, the first paper in the sequence we call solving tall, dense, linear, linear programs in near linear time. We showed you could, uh, you could get this poly D to be a D cubed. And there's been recent joint work that we show you can improve this D cube to D the 2.5. And currently, these three runtimes are the state of the art for solving linear programs, depending on the regime. Um, the way this method worked was through um, a few different pieces we'll talk about a bit more. It consists of a new interior point method that was essentially a simplified um, primal dual version of the root D iteration method I mentioned earlier. Um, as well as um, some variance uh, modifications to make it stable to allow for some of the approximate uh, protection tricks as were applied here. Um, that was one of the first key ingredients. The other piece underlying this result is a number of data structures to implement the iterations efficiently. Involving, uh, this involves sketching techniques to avoid looking at the entire input um, every iteration. Um, and broadly, I think this result follows by uh, a new robust IPM framework that we'll talk about a bit more this week, as well as a variety of new dynamic sampling and sketching techniques that I might talk about a little more on Thursday. Um, however, we will cover this week these, this uh, advance in the interior point method before the end of the week. All right, any questions on, on the, the state of the art um, before I go any further? Okay, so what time I have left, I want to start talking about combinatorial problems. Um, before I do that, I just want to give a quick sense of, I think, what some of the big techniques were that underlie these results that we'll talk about throughout the week. So all of these results, they, they're built upon some of the basic fundamental tools of linear programming, things like self-concordance, log barriers, primal dual methods, path following, and Newton, and we'll cover a variety of this tomorrow. Um, some of these advances also use this way to have improved the convergence rate, um, depend, the convergence rates of interior point methods as they depend on n versus d. And a common feature in many of these advances is some notion of robustness in these interior point methods. So somehow modifying interior point methods so that you don't need to maintain your iterates too precisely, but rather it suffices to maintain some sort of coarse approximation to them. Other key techniques that appear in these results are different ways of handling approximate linear system solvers and ways this might lose feasibility. Um, and there's other techniques as well as a number of data structures that, it, that underlie these results. Um, the goal of this week is to primarily cover some of these basic tools, these ways of sort of robustifying interior point methods and improving the iteration complexity, which I think is sort of the basic framework that then enables um, leveraging a number of uh, data structures and different techniques that get fast algorithms. Um, and the goals of the talk will be primarily to emphasize these, as well as give some combinatorial connections for all of these results. Um, I should note that there's even more results that have been used in some of the more recent breakthroughs, and I'll just touch upon these as we go, and feel free to ask questions about them. All right, so that's the rest of linear programming. As I have time the rest of today, I want to talk about what some of these advances mean or have been adapted for combinatorial optimization problems. Um, any questions about linear programming or the state of the art? Uh, so when you talk about data structures, are you talking in terms of uh, how IT is 
bringing in new types of data structures like dictionaries and all that in Python language? Do you mean in that sense? Um, sorry, repeat the second part of the question. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So when you say data structures, are you talking about like uh, the newer software, uh, like data structures that they are using? Like in Python, you have dictionaries and lists and sets. Are you talking in that sense or are you talking in terms of uh, how you're structuring the problem itself? So I mean in that sense, however, they're, they're slightly different data structure problems. So, 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 so for instance, one problem is this problem of you want to solve a sequence of linear systems and you want to solve a sequence of linear system. So in particular, you want to solve these linear systems in a transpose DA and you're given bounds on how much D changes. So you're given a sequence of vectors D and you know vectors you want to solve in and you want to solve every one of these linear systems so you're given changes to d and you're given changes to the vector you want to solve this is a natural data structure problem in that you have this output you want to out, uh, uh, something you want to output in every iteration under dynamic input however it's not necessarily a problem qu quite like some of the ones you said in the these programming packages you know it's maybe not established in the same way as a, as a problem um, and, and these works have developed improved solutions for them over time. Um, we might talk about a little bit more on Thursday, some of the other data structure problems. They're, they're also more, maybe a little more new problems that, that, that haven't been studied quite as much uh, uh, classically, but, but have a similar sort of feel. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sounds good, sounds good, all right. Yeah, good question though. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So I, as I started off in this talk, I said one of the big motivations for all of this work is to get advances in combinatorial optimization. So what about actually using interior point methods for solving more combinatorial problems than, than just linear programming? Um, and to start this discussion, I want to talk about one canonical a combinatorial optimization problem that I think is a good starting point for, for moving from thinking about linear programming to more graph related optimization problems. And this problem is minimum cost transshipment. All right, so this is just a fundamental graph theory, fundamental problem in algorithmic graph theory you might consider. So in this problem, we're given some directed graph with vertices V and edges E. We're given some vertex imbalances or demand D. Um, in other words, we're given a vector D, which is just some vector over the vertices and you can think for every single vertex, this is, uh, this is um, expressing the total imbalance you want to have of some flow. So think if you have a demand um, is positive, this is flow, this is some units of stuff you want to send over the network. And if the demand in some vertex is negative, that vertex needs to receive some units of stuff at that vertex. Um, this problem will also assume we're given some edge cost C. Um, which are just some non, uh, just some uh, real values to each of the edges of the graph. And what the minimum cost transshipment problem asks for is to find a non-negative flow F that routes these demands while minimizing the cost, where the cost is just the inner product of the flow with C. So in other words, the demands um, at every vertex in the graph specify how much stuff we want to send um, over what the stuff we want to send into or out of that vertex over the graph. C specifies the cost per unit of stuff over every edge. And our goal is to, to route these demands. So send stuff over the graph routing these demands at minimum cost. Every time I say stuff, I should be more formally saying flow. Um, and more formally than this problem is just asking for a non-negative assignment of values to every edge in the graph, specifying the flow on that edge or how much stuff is transmitted over that edge, such that the imbalance at every vertex is given by D and the sum over all the edges, the flow on the edge times the cost of the edge is minimized. Okay. Um, to be a little more formal about this, for any vector F, that's a real valued assignment of values to the edges of the graph, I'm going to call that vector f of flow, and I'm going to let um, I m of f. I'm going to denote this as the imbalance vector of f or the imbalances of f. I'm going to, and, that, and, and the imbalance of f is just this vector um, that's a real value of assignment to every vertex of the graph, where the imbalance of the eighth entry of this vector I'll use to denote the imbalance of f at f, um, at a 
which is simply the sum over all the edges uh, leaving vertex A, the flow on that edge, minus the flow on all the edges, the value of the flow on every edge going into A. So the imbalance of F at A is simply the total amount of flow leaving A minus the amount of flow going into A. With this, the, the problem we're trying to solve is simply trying to route F, meaning we're trying to get a, uh, route, uh, we're trying to route demands D, meaning we're trying to get a flow F where the imbalance of F is given by D. And we want to do that at lowest cost. All right, problem clear? All right, why would you wanna solve this problem? Um, there are a number of reasons you wanna solve this problem. Um, first, it generalizes a number of bipartite matching problems. So for instance, suppose you have some bipartite graph, you have some costs on all of the edges, and suppose you want to compute a perfect matching in the graph, so assignment of every vertex on the left to some vertex on the right, of minimum total cost. You can easily reduce that problem to, to solving the minimum cost. You can easily reduce uh, that problem to solving minimum cost transshipment simply by setting the demand at every vertex on the left to be one, the demand on every vertex on the right to be minus one, and then looking for the minimum cost transshipment of those demands. Right. Um, you could also generalize, um, you could also, gener uh, doing this, of, of, of course, where every edge is oriented from left to right. Um, there's a more general problem, the min cost uh, perfect matching. You could ask for min cost B matching, which is simply the same exact problem I wrote here, where you let all of uh, the same problem I, I wrote here, where you simply let every one of the demands be arbitrary. Um, and though I won't prove it, you can actually show min cost B matching is equivalent to min cost transshipment. There's a reduction between the two. Um, you can also use this to solve things like max weight matching. You can imagine simply, um, so imagine you had a bipartite graph. You want to compute a matching of maximum weight. You could simply repeat exactly this setup where we all we do is take this graph and we also add some new vertex. Um, sorry, you add some new vertex from every, um, uh, you add some new vertex where from every vertex on the left, you give it an edge to this vertex and you give it an edge to every vertex on the right. And you simply um, do this for every single vertex, giving these edges a very high cost. And you set the cost of each of these edges to be negative the weight. If you do this and solve exactly the same problem, you'll be incentivized to use as many of these edges as you possibly can, but you can always get a perfect matching by routing um, the demands over these vertices when you don't have another choice. So you can use this to solve uh, max weight matching. Um, there's also a popular problem in machine learning and operations research of optimal transport um, that's also equivalent to min cost B matching um, that, that you could also use this to solve. Um, this problem also generalizes things like shortest path in a graph with a uh, non with, with possibly with negative edge lengths. And to see that, you know, imagine we take exactly the min cost transshipment problem. We set the demand at some vertex S to be one, the demand at some vertex T to be minus one. Then any flow routing these demands is some distribution over ST paths. And the problem of minimizing the cost while routing these demands, you know, solving minimum cost transshipment with these demands is the same as computing a shortest path with negative edge lengths in this graph. All right. Problem clear? Great. All right. So what does this have to do with linear programming? So we just presented minimum cost transshipment from this graph theoretic perspective um, as just a natural problem in algorithmic graph theory. However, I claim there's another simpler way I could have motivated these problems just by our primal dual form of linear programming. So from a linear programming perspective, I claim these problems are equivalent to the following. They're the same as just solving a linear program in standard form whenever the matrix A is the edge vertex incidence matrix of the graph, or also known as a graph incidence matrix, or I might just call it an incidence matrix of short. And a matrix is an incidence matrix when every row has the property that it's all zero, except for exactly one entry that's a one and exactly one entry that's a minus one. 
And I claim there's a natural bijection between the minimum cross transshipment problem and linear programs where the constraint matrix A has this structure. Every row has exactly one one, and one minus one, and every other entry is zero. And the way, and the, the way to see this bijection is as follows. If you imagine taking such a linear program and imagine some row E has a one at you know, some column I and a minus one at column J, suppose whenever you do that, you think of there being an edge in a graph from vertex I to vertex J. I claim if you do that, if we had simply taken this problem, we let X to think of that as our flow. We took the vector B and mapped that to minus the edge costs and took this vector C and mapped that to the demands. Um, it turns out that the linear operator A transpose X is exactly the linear operator that corresponds to computing the imbalance of F. So if you want to compute the imbalance of F, that's the same as applying A transpose to F or equivalently uh, to this vector X, where again, A is just this, this uh, matrix where every row has a plus one and a minus one. And consequently, if you solve this problem of maximizing B transpose Y, that's the same as minimizing C transpose F, subject to the constraint that F is not negative, and it routes the demands. So these two problems are equivalent. It's just a restriction on these two problems are equivalent. And thus, min cost transshipment is just a special case of linear programming in primal dual form, where we just have this constraint on the sparsity pattern of our matrix. OK. Turns out this, just this, and what we've already discussed about linear programming is actually enough to immediately see some runtime improvements for min cost transshipment. And this follows from a rather beautiful, um, very impactful, powerful result in algorithmic graph theory, one of the big breakthroughs in algorithmic graph theory over the last little more than a decade, which essentially is as follows. So suppose we wanted to now apply the interior point methods for linear programming that we discussed to the min cost transshipment. In other words, we apply them to these linear programming problems when A has this graph structure, has the sparsity structure. Um, we said that you know, some of the advances in interior point methods, they involved uh, decreasing the number of linear systems in A you need to solve to solve um, these problems. Now, if you look at the linear system, A transpose DA for some non-negative diagonal matrix D, it turns out this matrix is a particular structured matrix known as a Laplacian matrix. Moreover, since every row has exactly one one and one minus one, you can form this matrix in nearly linear time and the number of edges. And it was the, this breakthrough result I mentioned was a beautiful result of Spielman and Tang in 2004 that actually showed these systems, you can solve them in nearly linear time. You can solve them in time nearly linear in the number of edges of the graph. And you can solve these linear systems to high precision. So in other words, if you apply the interior point methods to minimum cost transshipment, immediately you get that um, every iteration, rather than taking this arbitrary linear system solving time, which might involve a d to the omega or be improved to d squared, actually every iteration is implementable in nearly linear time. All right. So with this in mind, let's talk about what the actual state of the art is for minimum cost transshipment. So the state of the art is as follows. Um, you know, there's classic combinatorial work that showed you could solve the problem in MN, and there's been just a few improvements over the last few years. Um, here, I'm just writing the improvements for minimum cost transshipment in this general form of general integer bounded costs and demands. I should note that there's actually been additional improvements over the last few years in the particular case where there are integral demands and they're bounded. Um, and I should also note that min cost perfect matching has a similar history than this. There are just more improvements um, in the case that you're allowed to depend polynomially on how much the demands or cost varies. All right. So I want to say a few things about these improvements. So first, all of these improvements since the 1980s are from interior point methods. Each of these is an advance from using interior point methods. Um, and the second thing I want to note is um, uh, um, so actually, I'll get back to this. Let me talk a bit more about how these advances work. So, so first, this um, you know, so classically, it's known you could solve uh, min cost transshipment in MN time, um, and there was a result of Deitch and Spielman that, along with achieving a number of other things, essentially showed you could solve this problem in M to the three halves time. 
And the way this works is essentially you can show you can take exactly, you can do exactly what I described in the previous slide. You can apply the root m iteration method of Renegar and use that every iteration is a Laplacian and therefore can be implemented in nearly linear time. That gives you m to the three halves. Um, this was improved by Yintai Lee and myself um, by simply using that you could decrease the number of iterations from root m to root n. And that gives an m root n runtime. However, very recently, just the last two years, we showed you can improve a bit further and show that you could actually um, get a runtime that's m plus n to the 1.5. And I think what's interesting about this result is that whenever m is larger than n to the 1.5, in other words, this is the same as saying whenever the average degree of a vertex in the graph is at least root n, um, this m term is larger than n to the 1.5, and this is a nearly linear time algorithm, so, so it's nearly optimal. Um, the way this algorithm works is it's also root n iteration method. Um, it's similar to the nd plus poly d methods I talked about for linear programming. However, these methods essentially use that the data structure problems you would have for linear programming can be solved even more efficiently on graphs. So beyond just using that, you know, every iteration is a linear system, it uses that if you use the right robust versions of these methods, you can get that maintaining the iterations involves solving pr certain problems that you can solve by using dynamic data structures for meeting expanders, sparsification techniques, as well as these linear system solvers. All right. Um, and I should also note that both of these results use some of these techniques that were present in these n to the omega results on sort of robust interior point methods that we'll talk about a bit more. All right, and um, we'll see a good bit of how to do this m root n result by the end of this week, and I'll probably touch upon how to do this result um, by the end of the week, but but not cover in the same detail. Um, uh, I think uh, it's interesting also to see what these improvements are for the simpler simple one of the simplest cases you might imagine the setup of just solving by part type matching, which is a sp uh, particular special case. Um, and for that, there have been a few more improvements. So this particular problem is also solvable in n to the omega. There were some exciting results on improving the runtimes for max flow that have improved their runtime a little bit. And um, well, I'll talk a bit more about these uh, later. Um, and the state of the art um, is a combination of uh, better of either m to the 4 thirds or m plus n to the 1.5. And again, I want to note that all these results since the 1980s uh, use interior point methods or came from improving uh, omega. And this is the first time you can actually solve these problems in nearly linear time in some density regime. All right. Any questions about any of this? Um, does this go till 9.15 or am I over on time? Uh, no, it goes, it goes till uh, 9.15 your time. Yes, that's right. So you have 10 more minutes. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. OK. Any questions? Any questions on any any of this? Um, someone asked which of the advances use uh, randomization. Um, ooh, me, I, that's a good question. I should have an asterisk here because I believe each of these results. Um, there's a way of getting these results that don't use uh, randomness. Um, however, the rest all use randomness. So I think of the interior point methods I advanced, some of these ones for max flow that I'll talk a little bit more about right now, uh, don't use randomness. Um, the n to the omega, there's a, 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 by Jan van der Braun, there's a deterministic version of the n to the omega linear programming method that doesn't use randomness and everything else uses randomness. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was gonna tell you a question that Joseph uh, Cherian sent to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wanted to know if like the running times um, sort of include the time to find an optimal integral solution um, uh, for the for the flow problem. Um, ah, so that's a good question. So so uh, for for all of for for all of these, once you have a polylogarithmic dependence on the range of capacity, once you have a polylog, if you're in the case where the integers and the demands are sorry, the case where the demands and the costs are integer. And I'm allowed to use O tilde to hide logarithmic dependence on these values. These are runtimes for exactly solving the problems. They do include the runtime to get exact optimal solutions. 
Um, for linear programming to turn the runtimes I said into things that exactly find vertices of the polytope, we have to bring in a little bit more uh, and exactly solve the linear program. Um, uh, other parameters about the geometry of the polytope need to be incorporated um, to, to, tur to turn those into full runtimes. And I've been absorbing those in, in log fact and calling those log factors, though that's perhaps we can we can debate how fair that is in the case of linear programming in general. And there's great questions as as uh, the the organizers of this program well know on 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 trying to improve those. Any other questions? Yeah, but um, th these are definitely the runtimes to exactly solve the problem, and I believe you can get integral solutions for all of them. But I should perhaps double check. And happy to take that more offline. All right. So what else can we solve? So this is one example problem. However, there's a number of broader problems that I think I've all, that I've also mentioned you might try to solve. So there are other natural continuous optimization problems related to linear programming, like L1 and L infinity regression. Um, and there's broader families of combinatorial optimization problems we might try to use interior point methods for, like maximum flow and minimum cost flow. Um, there's also things like Markov decision processes, like fundamental problems in decision um, in operations research and reinforcement learning um, that we could also try to use interior point methods for. Um, and the first thing I, went, I think we might think of when thinking a number of these problems is maybe we can just use all the results I've mentioned before on minimum cost transshipment or linear programming. Like as we've already seen, there's natural transformations between these problems. So maybe we could just somehow encode these. Um, unfortunately, there's a real issue that arises when you try to do this. So for instance, suppose you want to solve L1 regression. You know, I could write this by something that looks like something kind of in standard form. Uh, there should be a minus V here. You know, I could say this is the same as minimizing for AX minus B being between a vector V and minus V, minimizing V. Um, this does include L1 regression. However, if you try to take this and somehow encode it in standard form, it's very tricky to find a way to do this that doesn't somehow increase the dimension of the problem. So turn the number of constraints into the number of variables. Uh, sorry, so this should be making N, uh, oh, sorry, this should be making a, D B omega N, All right? You can try, it's a great exercise. I don't really know how to encode L1 regression in standard form without increasing the dimension of the problem so that D is on the order of N, the number of rows of this matrix. Um, similarly, you could ask more broadly than solving max flow, you could try to solve min cost flow. And this is this, just the same as the minimum cost transshipment problem where additionally for every single edge, we have a capacity mu where mu sub e specifies the most amount of flow that uh, we can route on every edge. So the min cost flow problem is exactly the same. We want to find a flow that routes demands to d and minimizes costs, subject to the additional constraint that f is entry-wise at most mu. Right? Um, in the special case where all the capacities are sufficiently large, this encodes a min cost transshipment. And the problem of maximum st flow you can show is a special case of this just by um, making the cost uh, be one on some vec on, um, on a edge from T to S of sufficiently large capacity. Right? However, again, while you might, it's natural to try to encode this as min cost transshipment. Again, I don't know a way of actually doing this encoding without somehow, somehow increasing the number of vertices of the graph to be on the orders of the number of edges. In other words, if I try to encode max flow or min cost transshipment, uh, min cost flow is min cost transshipment. Don't know how to do that without getting a resulting graph that's sparse on average. All right. Um, and in fact, as far as I'm aware, I don't know how to do such a transformation. I think it's still open to do so. I haven't really thought hard about this question other than maybe a little bit when preparing the sides, if there's some sort of formal, lo what formal lower bound or what that would look like for this but I'm unaware of how to actually do any of these transformations. So how to black box use any of these results to, um, to get any sort of the sparsity dependent improvements in solving them. Um, however, it turns out that many of the results that I've described, if you, with a bit more work, if you carefully modify the method and try to directly tailor them to these settings, it turns out you can get the same sort of runtime improvements I've already described. 
And the way this works, these met, one way to think about these results is that you can imagine considering a slightly broader primal or dual form. So rather than just minimizing C transpose X, where A transpose X equals B and every XI is uh, larger than zero, you can imagine we have two-sided constraints on every XI and looking at the associated dual. So this is another just slightly broader primal dual form of linear programs. Um, and it turns out uh, primal dual programs. And if you took this slightly broader form, which I sometimes call like linear programs with two-sided constraints because of this XI lying between an upper and lower bound, if you took these broader primal dual forms, when A is an incidence matrix of a graph, this primal form directly encodes min cost flow. Um, this dual problem directly encapsulates L1 regression by appropriately setting the LI and the mu I. And you can show that things like L infinity regression and Markov decision problems are efficiently reducible um, to these forms. Further, you can show that many of the runtimes we've discussed are extendable to this setting. So you can also turn out solve these linear programs and root D linear systems. Um, the same uh, runtime of NNZ plus D squared root D also applies to this more general form. And you know, the results I said for, for min cost transshipment and linear programming, they actually also apply to this form, but with more work. Like it takes a bit more um, techniques and tricks to, to adapt methods to this setting, but it turns out you can do so. Um, I mentioned them here because probably for the rest of the week, I'll be focusing primarily on max flow. I'm uh, sorry, I'll be focusing primarily on linear programming and min cost transshipment as it makes some of the pictures and the algebra and the analysis a bit nicer to be working with standard form. And maybe at the end on Thursday, I'll talk a bit about um, the work and advances that need to happen to translate these results to this more general setting that, that complicates a bit of the analysis. All right. So maybe in the one minute I have left, I guess with all of this discussion, I should perhaps say what the state of the art is for solving max flow, which is one prominent case, special case of solving these problems. So remember in the max flow problem, the max flow problems as follows. We have some graph G, some vertices V and edges E. We also have some integer capacities, a special vertex S and T. And our goal is to send as much flow as possible from S to T without exceeding the capacity constraints. So without putting more than uh, union, uh, the UE units of flow on any edge E, All right? So this is a very well-studied, famous combinatorial optimization problem with many advances and res uh, results over the decades. Um, and uh, a brief summary of some of the histories as follows. So there's a number of classical work on solving these, this problem in the uncapacitated case where the uncapacitated case, which is I'll think of as the case where every capacity is one, there's classic results going back to the 70s showing that you could solve the problem in the better of the number of edges to the three halves and the number of edges times the number of vertices to the two thirds. There was then a number of advances over the years to culminate in this beautiful result of Goldberg in round 98 that up to log factors, you get the same runtime, even in the capacitated case. Okay. Now, these results use a variety of combinatorial techniques, versions for different variants of augmenting paths or blocking flows, um, blocking flows. However, in the last decade, there's been a number of improvements to solving these problems, which as you might e expect, given the theme of the talk today, these advances all used interior point methods in some way, shape or form. Um, so first there was a pair of results of uh, Madri and Tedley and myself showing that in the sparse and dense case, you get slightly faster run times. So I usually need this uh, cheat sheet to help me internalize what they, these are. So the first was this M to the three halves was improved to M to the 10 sevenths uh, by Madri. So 10 sevenths is three halves minus one over 14. So this is a slightly improvement to M to the three halves when M is sparse. And the result of the entire Lee and myself that improved this M times M to the two thirds to M redact in the dense case. Um, in the last few years, there have been a pair of results that have gone beyond just using Laplacian system solvers and interior point methods. They use um, uh, another um, algorithmic primitive for flows known as smooth LP flows. And the runtime has been improved uh, up to M to the four thirds, which uh, using the helpful cheat sheet is three halves minus one over six. Um, just in the last uh, year, there have been two more improvements that um, two more improvements. So these results of improving them to the four thirds were in the uncapacitated case. 
But there were two improvements in just the last year in the capacitated case using dynamic data structures in addition to Laplacian system solvers, where the first is um, that the problem can be solved in n plus n to the 1.5. And the other is, um, which is the first nearly near time algorithm any density. And the other is a very exciting work in this last year that showed you could solve the problem in a little bit better than n to the three halves, but you could do this in the capacitated case using um, different, uh, slightly different uh, dynamic data structure than the ones that under, underlie this result. All right. So that's it for today. Um, that's that's uh, it for kind of the survey of advances in interior point methods over the last decade. Um, what I'll be doing next lecture is starting to go through interior point methods and the basic uh, techniques underlie them and start talking about improving from N dependencies to D dependencies. Um, that's it for today. Uh, sorry for going just a little over on time. Thank you for the questions and your attention. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.